everyone! Much like scorpions, we're talking today about a group of arthropods who make themselves hard to love with their painful sting. Let's jump right in. I'm talking about wasps. These hymenopterans are well known for being painful, but this isn't all they're known for. They have much to teach us about haplodiploidy, eusociality, hexapod paraphyly, and extreme biodiversity. Thus, we should really see them as beautiful products of evolution, just like ourselves. First, we need to manage some phylogenetics. Wasps are arthropods, those animals with segmented legs and exoskeletons. Within Arthropoda is the class Insecta, its members having a head, abdomen, and thorax, three pairs of jointed legs, compound eyes, and one pair of antennae. And within Insecta is the order Hymenoptera, which originated about 220 million years ago, comprising sawflies, wasps, bees, and ants. Interestingly, all members of Hymenoptera are haplodiploid. This means the fertilized egg, the diploid ones, become female, while the unfertilized eggs, the haploid ones, become male. In years past, haplodiploidy was considered to be the cause of eusociality, which is the highest form of animal sociality, including cooperative brood care, overlapping generations of adults, and a division of labor into reproductive and non-reproductive groups. Haplodiploid kin selection, the evolutionary strategy that favors the reproductive success of an organism's relatives, was previously considered to be the major reason that eusociality and altruism cropped up in different species, because in haplodiploid species, the members, especially the females, are very closely related to each other. After all, since your relatives carry some of your genes, you want them to survive even if you don't, because some of your genes will still get passed on. However, with the discovery of many diplodiploid eusocial animals, where both males and females have the full set of chromosomes, and many non-eusocial haplodiploid animals, the idea that haplodiploid kin selection universally drives the origin of eusociality is not accepted. Both altruism and eusociality are still easily explained by natural selection. Back to the phylogenetics. Within Hymenoptera is the suborder Apocrita, which contains wasps, bees, and ants. Their relationship can be a bit confusing since there are things like velvet ants, aka the cow killer, that are actually wingless female wasps, and things like bees that mimic wasps. Not to mention the many other arthropods outside this group that mimic ants, bees, and wasps respectively. You might think that after recognizing the mimics as just mimics, we can classify the true members of Apocrita as separate groups. But, instead of wasps, bees, and ants being their own separate clades, all three are derived from some ancestral wasp-like animal. While bees and ants form their own respective monophyletic clades, called Anthophila, the clade of bees, and Formicidae, the clade of ants, these two are derived from the paraphyletic group that consists of the rest of Apocrita, which we call wasps. Because they are derived from wasps, we should consider both bees and ants as different groups of wasps, one turned vegetarian and the other flightless. In the same way that we consider snakes as a group of tetrapods and birds as a group of dinosaurs. And just like we expect to find fossils of snakes with legs and fossils of birds with more classical dinosaurian traits, and we have, we should also expect to see fossils of bees and ants with more typical wasp traits. For example, the earliest fossil ant discovered is the late Cretaceous wasp-like Sphecomirma, the existence of which was predicted by paleontologists, a fact that R.J. Downard makes note of in his book Evolution's Slam Dunk. Yes, Paleontologists saw the diversity of ants in the Oligocene and Miocene and predicted that the ancestor of those ants should be found in the Cretaceous. As E.O. Wilson, Frank Carpenter, and William Brown point out in their 1967 paper, The First Mesozoic Ants, it is, quote, a near perfect link between certain non social tifid wasps and the most primitive Myrmesioid ants, close quote. On the bee side, they are derived from the predatory Crabronidae clade of wasps, which, as you can tell from the name, was previously considered a family. 
The 100 million year old relative of modern bees named Melitisfex has characteristics diagnostic of both bees and Crabronidae wasps and is currently the most primitive bee ancestor. One hypothesis for the switch from prey to pollen is that those early bees consumed insects that were covered in pollen, so the bees eventually switched to pollen only. And, with both ants and bees having characteristics shared with wasps, should creationists consider all the thousands of members of Apocrita to be one created kind? Judging by a 2014 posting at Creation Wiki, which avoided their own terminology of kinds, so far it looks like they haven't worked that one out. Now we reach the ancestral group of wasps. I mentioned at the beginning that they are known for their painful sting, but how did they get that stinger? One might invoke irreducible complexity to argue for an intelligent designer. After all, what can you do with half a stinger? However, how the stinger evolved is well understood. It's nothing more than a highly modified ovipositor, which is an organ some animals use for laying eggs. The same is true for bees, of course. This is the reason why only females have stingers. The ovipositor can serve different functions depending on what species it's in. For example, sawflies use their ovipositor to slice open plants before laying their eggs, and the Ichneumonidae wasp, Megarissa, uses its ovipositor to bore into wood. These are basal members of the order Hymenoptera that don't sting, which indicates that the modified ovipositors were first used to lay eggs inside plants, then on or into living hosts, often with paralyzing venom, which could also be used secondarily for defense. And then it became a true stinger in the more derived aculeate wasps, including bees and ants, that don't pass the egg along the stinger and only inject venom. Interestingly, Charles Darwin was troubled by the lifestyle of the Ichneumonidae wasps, writing in 1860 to his friend Acer Gray, quote, I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent god would have designedly created the Ichneumonidae with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars, close quote. Darwin is describing parasitoidism. We covered this in Coevolution, which, according to Evolution of Developmental Strategies in Parasitic Hymenoptera, occurred just once in the common ancestor of all members of Apocrita. From that ancestor, the wasps, bees, and ants went down all sorts of different evolutionary paths, invading different niches and testing varying physiological processes. While some kept using the ovipositor, or stinger, to deliver paralyzing venom into the host for the eggs, Others lost the parasitoidism in their life cycle and used the stinger only for defense, and some completely lost the stinger itself. Among them are Cynipoidea, Proctotrupoidea, Platygastroidea, and Chalcidoidea, each having members that have been kicking around since the days of dinosaurs. Then, within the clade of stinging hymenopterans called Aculeata, we meet the Chucku wasps who lay their eggs in the nests of other insects. Once the wasp eggs hatch, the offspring eat the eggs of the other insect, making them kleptoparasites. We also meet the family Vespidae, the family containing many eusocial as well as solitary species, including some of our least favorite picnic guests, such as the yellow jacket. Mutilidae contains those large, wingless ant wasps known as velvet ants, as previously mentioned, which are actually the females. Pompilidae has the spider wasp, who derive their name from their common behavior of hunting and killing spiders as food for their larvae. Sphesidae include sand wasps and mud daubers, and the burrowing aphid wasps are in the subfamily Pemphredoninae. As you can see, wasps are extremely diverse and have a long evolutionary history that entangles them with both the bees and ants. Whether the wasps are pollinators or parasitoids, they're fascinating. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.